Welcome back to Raid Guides in a Trench Coat, featuring the Garden of Salvation, the Vault of Grass. Welcome to Gambit. If you want to point to the adopted red-headed stepchild of the Destiny Raid, then look no further than the Garden of Salvation. A raid exotic that doesn't drop, three encounters of the same boss that isn't the final boss, and instead of playing a long complicated strike, you're playing Gambit. The best thing they did was patch out the Crucible versions of every raid. Now, none of this is to say that the Garden of Salvation is a bad raid. It's actually, quintessentially, the most Destiny raid that there is. Broken raid mechanics, buggy time-based challenges, fuck the second encounter, and a mechanic that actively sunsets gameplay while you tether. If you love Destiny, then this is the raid for you. Or at least love to hate on Destiny, because boy howdy, the last time I heard anyone say anything good about this game was back when the Shattered Throne was the only dungeon that we had. And yet, we're all still paying and playing. The first encounter starts a three encounter triad of dealing with the same boss over and over again like a bad case of the League of Villains showing up. After a short segment of Vex Battleground Mooned, hop through the teleporter and deep into the Black Garden. Here you'll find an oversized harpy that is a totally unique asset that will never be reused in any capacity, which is boring a minotaur which is a behavior that, even if somehow some dungeon designer wanted to copy the Garden of Salvation's homework, would be a totally unique interaction and not at all copied. There are two ways to start this encounter. Either open the door or kill a minotaur the harpy is snacking on. Now the encounter is time based and you'll have to open the door either way so there is really no reason to shoot the minotaur as part of the encounter but it's worth noting that it is a choice just like it is a choice to play crucible. The ensuing toxicity is the epitome of you reap what you sow. The tether mechanic works like a Minecraft redstone circuit where you're the repeater and this 3D printed crosshair looking thing is the piston door that you found the schematics for on TikTok. Shoot the cube to enable tethering, then stand close to it. If you get almost too far, then the tether will turn red. If you get too far, then the tether will break. You need to boost the tether signal strength between some number of you until you can get it into the crosshair to open the door. Also, being tethered prevents you from using your gun. But it's not a problem. Might make some things look difficult later on, but that's a problem that you'll deal with when you come to it. Once the door is open, you'll split into two competitive teams of professional leapfroggers. The home team at any given time will be clearing ads and dealing with the boss's hairballs that he insists on throwing up all over the place. I don't know what the Black Garden is feeding this fucker, but it should probably switch to wet food and see if there is any difference. Picking up a hairball gives you a long debuff that just says, hey, don't pick up another debuff and wait for it to be your turn again, you stupid bitch. Once you have that debuff, you can start running towards the away team or continue helping your home team clear ads. It doesn't really matter, it just depends on how much resilience your third pickup hunter happens to be running. On the away team, your job is to kill a bunch of ads until the Hydra Angelic appears. Much like the servitors of the Deepstone Crypt, the Angelics of the Garden block your ability to interact with the Tether Cube mechanics. So kill the Hydra to unlock the box, which could spawn in any one of what feels like 17 different places. Shoot the box to start the Tether and lead it to the door like before, only now instead of getting the opportunity to run away from the digestively compromised Discord kit and Harpy, you must now face it since half of your fire team has the debuff and you do not. The original home team becomes the away team and leapfrogs past the original away team into whatever room opened up. Inside, they'll rinse and repeat killing ads, killing the angelic, etc, etc. For the final door, you'll have to do three tethers total. The first tether will stop the boss from spewing hairballs, and the second two tethers are generally best done with more than three people. And then, no one will be seated during the Black Friday opening simulator segment of the encounter. Pick up discounted hairballs while avoiding the overloads and cyclopses trying to trample you. Don't stand next to the chest, or you will get deleted. Now the jumping puzzle portion of the raid is kind of rough because it relies on shooting these bulbs which blossom out into leaves and then you can see the light on the other side of the room but before strand and skating you had to figure out how to get through the maze of pillars without getting dickwalled by vex architecture. Have one person make it, pull you, and wipe before launching into the second encounter. Hey batter batter hey batter batter swing. The vex build a baseball diamond in the middle of the black garden because it's the only sport that they can figure out. Soccer? That's a guardian sport. Water polo? Out of the question. Football? Not until we get old Chicago and unlock the Post Witness America DLC. As far as raid encounters with personal responsibility out the ass, this one is pretty up there. There are four different sectors that each have one of these obelisks that you have to protect. If a Vex is allowed to commune with it, it'll nuke the encounter. Designate four players to be the base men. They'll travel around to get to their plates, kill the angelic protecting the tether box, and then leave them behind as the rest of the group continues on towards the further players' bases. Sometimes this is done as a big bus going clockwise around the arena, and other times you split into teams of two and the third base man meets one of the runners all the way up in the north. 
Speaking of runners, the remaining two players will float between the bases and be the second required redstone repeater for when the players need to start tethering every 45 seconds. This white haze around the screen is the Enlightened buff, and light end because it's like somebody cranked the gamma up to 11. But the Enlightened buff is important because after the first wave or so, any vex that comes crawling towards your pylon will have big white buck U shields that make them immune to everything you throw at them. Well, immune to everything but stasis. Despite being the sect of Vex dedicated to the darkness, Soul Divisive still clearly knows nothing about how the power actually works. That being said, there isn't enough discipline in this sinful world to make a grenade recharge build fast enough to keep them all resting eternally in the frozen depths of your prison. You'll have to deal with them eventually, and this buff will let you break the shields. Once all the pylons are activated, then mobs of three angelics will start popping up at plates and denying use of the enlightenment cube, which really fucking sucks when you're halfway through finishing your tether and it gets shut off and now you're caught naked with three damage sponges to deal with before you can tether again. Anyway, that'll happen on four of the plates and then the data spaghetti wall fizzle away and everyone will rush the pitcher's mound for a final stand where everyone will need to get into one big long tether, kill angelics, and prepare to summon the consecrated mind. <laughs> All right, great. Now with half the raid behind us, we can finally kill the first thing we saw when entering deep into the Black Garden. The third encounter will split players once again into two teams, Gambit and Optometry. The Optometry team is in charge of babysitting the boss as it runs between four areas, washing machine and the rest of them. When the boss gets to where it's going, it'll bring back the hairballs from the first encounter, which are now really sticky for some reason. The boss will then expose three of its fins, all of which will have an in eye and an out eye. For the player in the sticky, one of those sets will be glowing. They'll need to call out which eyes those are so that they and two friends can shoot the correct eyes. Or you can do it yourself if you think you're fast enough. Anyhow, it's a team of three people anyways because the buff still carries the hey, don't immediately take another one of these caveat. That said, you can absolutely just throw your body at a second hairball and spend one res token at the shop of skipping mechanics. With how little people will be playing Gambit in the coming seasons, you might just be forced to jump on that grenade anyway. Once you've died and been rezzed, you will have lost the debuff, so technically that allows you to pick up three in a row. On the Gambit team, you'll peer down the hallways until you see one with a huge Minecraft beacon of light coming out of it. You'll then have to find a void shielded Minotaur, kill it, and bank its moat to the beacon. You'll then have the only enlightened buff and are relegated to defend the tower until the next runner arrives duty, which usually lasts a good 5 to 10 seconds longer than your buff, so have fun body blocking those. The next person will need to kill two minotaurs and claim a total of 10 moats before beelining for the beacon. As you run down this hallway, you'll need to avoid all the fake IRS call bots now that you've accidentally put your phone number into some sketchy yet totally safer work website. A third person will do the same, and barring your condom's chance at letting a vex fertilize the pylon, that'll leave you with 25 banked moats of the 30 required to start the damage phase. This is where the variance of this encounter exists. You can start with your first person picking up 10 moats, which will grant you the challenge chest since you're definitely playing this raid on rotator, but it leaves you dangerously susceptible to vex sacrifices. Your other choice is to just have your first runner kill another minotaur after the third player goes to deposit and bring five moats with them. There's also a world in which you could just have each person in the fire team run five moats and cycle between the eyes and the gambit teams so that you're never in danger of losing the enlightened buff, but I think I've made my stance on ludicrously overcomplicated solutions and players' average intelligence is quite clear. I'm honestly surprised that that isn't the challenge. Once that 30th moat gets deposited, the boss is going to make a beeline for the beacon like an understimulated elementary schooler whose mom has games on her phone. When you, the responsible parent, says no, the harpy's eyes are going to get red and he's going to start crying. For legal reasons, this is the part where the metaphor is no longer endorsing or offering parenting advice. Shoot that bitch in the eyes and every lit up orifice that it has. Once it goes white and starts trying to flee, the true damage phase has begun. Chase it down the corridor and delete its health bar to finally be rid of the persistent piece of shit and open the gates to the final encounter. Only first, a rite of passage. As the new player, everyone else is anxiously awaiting to hear your initial reactions to the truly sublime beauty that is the true Black Garden landscape through this portal. Bungie may not have gotten a lot right with Shadowkeep, but any way to bully freshly picked blueberries is certainly doing wonders to bolster my loyalty to Bungie's brand. The second jumping puzzle will start with the tightest ferris wheel platform of your life. Edge and clench your butt cheeks until you get high enough that you can clamber onto the cliff and rush away into the dead tree where you'll face even more shoot to bloom foliage. Monkey your way to the branches until you walk over the crest to set your gaze onto the sanctified mind. The sanctified mind boss fight is a prime example of how Bungie would have us believe their interdepartment workflow operates made manifest. It's a new Gambit map, a new PvP map, 
an exotic quest, and a story mission all wrapped up into one warped, unfinished product that could have been three perfectly complete individual products if they had just lending the Gambit support earlier in production. Oh, and the floor is lava. Once again, there are a number of different strategies for making this encounter happen, but to mitigate personal responsibility, I recommend a 2-2-2 split. Two players to spearhead a team, then a second pair of two, and some buddies to cosplay to The encounter begins with an angelic spawning in the middle which will block the tether cubes on top of the light and dark pylons. These pylons serve as banks for the two different kinds of moats instead of the singular type of moats we've been used to up to this point. Once the angelic is killed, two red weak points on the boss will light up. Shooting the left side leg spot will open a portal to the light island, and shooting the right side shoulder spot will open a portal to the dark island. The two teams will take turns purging the natural resources of small island nations by jumping through the portals and killing all the vex for about 15 to 18 moats. Now it's entirely possible that a moat or two falls off, but you will need 30 on each side in the end. If you drop too many because of some overzealous shoulder charging and ragdolling, you might just get fucked over and have to take an extra trip. Once you secured all of the moats, call out for an extraction. Players on the outside will ignore your call until you realize that they've been shooting the wrong weak point, which you'll then have to grapple with if that's a better or worse reality. With the first team being extracted, the portal will be open for the second team to jump in. The first team should deposit, the second team will start their small-scale genocide, and Team Aqua is going to be squeeing with glee because there will seem to be less landmass than before. That's because every time you shoot to open a portal, whether you wanted to use it or not, two things will happen. One, a Cyclops will spawn on that side of the arena and start taking pot shots at you, and two, the floor will get literally deleted. As a chunk of the floor is about to get deleted alongside everything on it, a great quantity of digital red artifacts will warn you to back the fuck away from the construction zone. It's time for Bob, Bob, and the gang of random other damn pricks who keep getting in the way of the fucking tether to rebuild those platforms so that you aren't jumping up and down on the pile of Legos hidden underneath the Vex radio area. Take the tether from either pylon and make it stretch to the 3D crosshair shapes around the missing platform's edge to reform it. When Bob the Builder retired from children's television, he gave Team Magma a call and started up their terraforming division. Now he probably needs a design team with how run down this looks, but maybe that's what happened in Season of the Splicer. Bob the Builder called up Hacker and said, Hey, I have some robots that need fixing and redesigning, and Hacker said, Say no more. I was really hoping that my limited knowledge of children's TV would leave me with actual quotes to pull, but did you know that there are 14 seasons of Cyber Chase now? One released in April. Of this year. Shit, I'm old. Where were we? Right. Now that the first team has returned with their moats, they'll deposit into the light pylon, assuming you did the light side portal first. Almost everybody does, but hey, dare to be different, I guess. With the moats deposited, the two team members will now have the enlightened buff and the Vex will start spawning with shields. General rule of thumb is break shields first, and then when the buff runs out, start ramming your body into them like you're trying to push a pull door. When the second team comes back and deposits, the pylon should light up and make some weird ding sound. That means that, even though Vex will still crowd up around it, it's entirely safe from being sacrificed to. You've wrapped it in bubble wrap and now it's virtually impenetrable. Rinse and repeat on the dark side, and now you've got two full pylons and nowhere for the Vex to sacrifice themselves. This will make the sanctified mind upset. In response, the boss will create a huge blue or orange cross in front of him while spawning another angelic. Kill the angelic and use at least three people to stretch the appropriate tether to the boss's cross which will start the damage phase. In a stunning turn of events, you could extend the damage phase by then connecting the unused tether to the boss in the same way, but people don't tend to go for that. They just use the shortened damage phase to fire up into the boss while huddled up near the unused pylon for some extra damage from armor mods that nobody casual kept the armor around for. Odds are you won't be one-phasing this unless you're using some hyper-curated speedrunning build. Directly after the damage phase is the best time for Bob and Bob and all the damn pricks who suddenly don't want to be involved in the rebuilding platforms to try and get some uninterrupted building time in before the boss spawns in an angelic to interrupt them. Do all of that moat banking and tethering, and then probably do it again. And congratulations, you've completed the Garden of Salvation. Did you know that instead of jumping across the radial area to reach the triangle stuff, you can wait on the platforms and a bridge will appear? Go watch a real guide.